Welcome to the reading of the 50th Law by 50 Cent and Robert Greene. Chapter 4. Keep moving. Calculated. Momentum. In the present, there is constant change and so much we cannot control. If you try to micromanage it all, you lose even greater control in the long run. The answer is to let go and move with the chaos that presents itself to you. From within it, you will find endless opportunities that elude most people. Don't give others the chance to pin you down. Keep moving and changing your appearances to fit the environment. If you encounter walls or boundaries, slip around them. Do not let anything disrupt your flow. The Hustler's Flow The old musicians stay where they are and become like museum pieces under glass. Safe, easy to understand, playing that tired old ish over and over again. Bebop was about to change, about evolution. It wasn't about standing still and becoming safe. If anybody wants to keep creating, they have to be about change. Miles Davis. When Curtis Jackson first started hustling in the late 1980s, it was a chaotic world that he entered. Crack cocaine had hit the streets and turned everything upside down. Now the corner hustler was unleashed, moving to wherever there was money to be made. This new breed of drug dealer had to contend with hundreds of scheming rivals. The erratic drug addicts, the old style gang leaders who were trying to muscle their way back into the business police who swarmed over the area. It was like the wild west out there, every man for himself, making up his own rules as he went along. Some couldn't stand this, they wanted structure, somebody to tell them when to get up and get to work. They didn't last too long in this new order, others thrived on all the anarchy and freedom. Curtis was of the latter variety. Then one day, everything changed. An old style gangster, nicknamed the Godfather, made a play for control over the drug traffic of Southside Queens and he succeeded. He installed his son Jermaine in Curtis's neighborhood and the son quickly laid down the law. The family was there to bring order to the business. Jermaine, would be selling these purple top capsules for a cheap price. It would be one size fits all. His capsules were nothing. Nobody could compete with his prices and any hustler that tried to defy him would be intimidated into submission. They were now all working for Jermaine. Curtis found this hard to accept. He did not like any kind of authority. He kept trying to get around Jermaine's tight grip on the area by selling his own stuff on the sly. But Jermaine and his team of enforcers kept catching him. Finally, they inflicted a good beating on him and he decided it would be wise to surrender for the time being. Jermaine liked Curtis' independent spirit and decided to take the youth under his wing, schooling him on what he was up to. He had done some time in prison and had studied business and economics there. He was going to run the crack cocaine business according to a model inspired by some of the more successful corporations in America. He aimed for control of the local drug business through cheap prices and a complete monopoly on traffic. That was the evolution of all successful enterprises, even the new ones such as Microsoft. He personally hated all the disorder on the streets. It was bad for business and made him uneasy. One day he drove by in his red Ferrari and invited Curtis to come along for the ride. 
He drove to the nearby Baisley Projects, which were controlled back then by the Pharaohs, a gang that was heavily invested in the crack trade and notorious for its violent ways. Curtis watched with growing discomfort as Jermaine explained to its leaders his plan for the neighborhood. He couldn't have freelancers and gangs operating on the margins of his empire. The Pharaohs would have to fall in line as well, but he'd find a way to make it profitable for them. The man's arrogance was increasing by the day. Perhaps he would follow this visit up with some violent act to show the Pharaohs he meant what he said. But Curtis had a real bad feeling from that afternoon. Over the next few days, he did whatever he could to avoid running into Jermaine. Sure enough, a week later, Jermaine was shot in the head and killed in one of the back alleyways of the hood. Everyone knew who did it and why. In the months to come, Curtis thought long and hard about what had happened. A part of him had identified with Jermaine. He too had great ambitions and wanted to forge some kind of empire within the hood. With all the competition on the streets, this could never be an easy task. It was natural then for someone like Jermaine to decide that the only way to create this empire was through force and the buildup of a monopoly. But such an effort was futile. Even if he had lasted longer, there were too many people operating on the fringes who resented his takeover and would have done whatever they could to sabotage him. The fiends would have grown tired of his one-size-fits-all approach. They liked variety, even if it was only in the color of the capsules. The police would have taken notice of his large operation and tried to break it up. Jermaine had been living in the past and ideas cooked up in prison in the 1970s, the grand era of the drug lord. Time had passed him by, and in the ruthless dynamic of the hood, he paid for this with his life. What was needed was a new skill set, a different mentality for handling the chaos, and Curtis would be the hustler to develop these skills to the maximum. For this purpose, he let go of any desire to dominate an area with one large operation. Instead, he started experimenting with four or five hustlers at the same time. Inevitably, one of the angles would work and pay for all the others. He made sure he always had options, room to move in case the police pushed in and cut off one of his access routes. He interacted with the fiends looking for any changes in their tastes and ways he could appeal to them with some new marketing scheme. He let those who worked for him do things on their own time. As long as they produced results, he wanted as little friction as possible. He never stayed tied to one venture, one partner, or one way of doing things for very long. He kept moving. The chaos of the streets was part of his flow something he learned to exploit by working from within it. Operating this way, he slowly accumulated the kind of hustling empire that could surpass what even Jermaine had attempted. In 2003, Curtis, now known as 50 Cent, found himself thrust into corporate America, working within Interscope Records and dealing with the growing number of businesses that wanted to ally themselves with him. Coming from the streets with no formal business background, it was natural for him to feel intimidated in this new environment. But within a few months, he saw things differently. The new skills he had developed in the hood were more than adequate. What he noticed about the business executives he dealt with was rather shocking. They operated by these conventions that seemed to have little to do with the incredible changes going on in the business environment. The record industry, for instance, was being destroyed by digital piracy, but the executives could only think of somehow maintaining their monopoly on ownership and distribution. They were incapable of adapting to the changes. They interacted only with themselves, not with their customer base, so their ideas never evolved. They were living in the past, 
when all of the business models were simple and control was easy to come by. They had the germane mentality through and through. And in 50's mind, they would someday suffer a similar fate. 50 would stay true to his street strategies. He would opt for fluid positions and room to move. This meant branching out into ventures that were not at all traditional for a rapper. Vitamin water, a line of books, an alliance with General Motors and Pontiac. These associations seemed disorderly and random, but it was all tied to his compelling image that he continued to shape. He worked five different angles at the same time. If one venture failed, he learned and moved on. The business world was like a laboratory that he would use for constant experimentation and discovery. He would mix and mingle with his employees up and down the line and with his audience, allowing them to alter his ideas. The centerpiece of this flow strategy would be the internet, a chaotic space with endless opportunity for a hustler like himself. Without knowing exactly where it would lead, he began putting together his own website. At first, it was a place to showcase new videos and get feedback from the public. Soon, it began to morph into a social network, bringing together his fans from all over the world. This gave him endless space to market his brand and track the changing moods of his audience. His website would continue to evolve like a living organism. He placed no limits on what he could become. Years later, Having moved beyond music into as many varied realms as possible, 50 could look back on all the people he had left far behind. The record executives, fellow rappers, and business leaders who had gone astray amid all the rapid fluctuations in the early part of the century. A whole gallery of germane types who had no flow. No matter the changes to come, he would continue to thrive in this new Wild West environment, just as he had on the streets. The Fearless Approach. 50 Cent is a person I created. Soon, it will be time to destroy him and become somebody else. 50 Cent. As infants, we were surrounded by many things that were unfamiliar and unpredictable. People acting in ways that did not make sense. Events that were hard to figure out. This was the source of great anxiety. We wanted the world around us to be more familiar. What was not so predictable became associated in our minds with darkness and chaos. Something to dread. Out of this fear, a desire was born deep inside of us to somehow gain greater control over the people and events that eluded our grasp. The only way we knew how to do this was to grab and hold, to push and pull, exerting our will in as direct a manner as possible to get people to do what we wanted. Over the years, this can become a lifelong pattern of behavior, more subtle as an adult, but infantile at heart. Every individual we come across in life is unique with his or her own energy, desires, and history. But wanting more control over people, our first impulse is generally to try to push them into conforming to our moods and ideas, into acting in ways that are familiar and comfortable to us. Every circumstance in life is different, but this elicits that old fear of chaos and the unknown. We cannot physically make events more predictable, but we can internally create a feeling of greater control by holding on to certain ideas and beliefs that give us a sense of consistency and order. This hunger for control, common to all of us, is the root of so many problems in life. Staying true to the same ideas and ways of doing things makes it that much harder for us to adapt to the inevitable changes in life. If we try to dominate a situation with some kind of aggressive action, this becomes our only option. We cannot give in or adapt or bide our time. That would mean letting go of our grip and we fear that. 
Having such narrow options makes it hard to solve problems. Forcing people to do what we want makes them resentful. Inevitably, they sabotage us or assert themselves against our will. What we find is that our desire to micromanage the world around us comes with a paradoxical effect. The harder we try to control things in our immediate environment, the more likely we are to lose control in the long run. Most people tend to think of these forms of direct control as power itself, something that shows strength, consistency, or character. But in fact, the opposite is the case. They are forms of power that are infantile and weak, stemming from that deep-rooted fear of change and chaos. Before it is too late, you need to convert to a more sophisticated, fearless concept of power. One that emphasizes fluidity. Life has a particular pace and rhythm, an endless stream of changes that can move slowly or quickly. When you try to stop this flow mentally or physically by holding on to things or people, you fall behind. Your actions become awkward because they are not in relation to present circumstances. It is like moving against a current as opposed to it to propel you forward. The first and most important step is to let go of this need to control in such a direct manner. This means that you no longer see change and chaotic moments in life as something to fear, but rather as a source of excitement and opportunity. In a social situation in which you want the ability to influence people, your first move is to bend to their different energies. You see what they bring and you adapt to this. Then, find a way to divert their energy in your direction. You let go of the past way of doing things and adapt your strategies to the ever-flowing present. Often what seems like chaos to us is merely a series of events that are new and hard to figure out. You cannot make sense of this apparent disorder if you are reactive and fearful, trying to make everything conform to patterns that exist only in your mind. By absorbing more of these chaotic moments with an open spirit, you can glimpse a pattern, a reason why they are occurring, and how you can exploit them. As part of this new concept, you are replacing the old stalwart symbols of power, the rock, the oak tree, with that of water, the element that has the greatest potential force in all of nature. Water can adapt to whatever comes its way moving around or over any obstacle. It wears away rock over time. This form of power does not mean you simply give in to what life brings you and drift. It means that you channel the flow of events in your direction, letting this add to the force of your actions and giving you powerful momentum. In places like the hood, the concept of flow is more developed than anywhere else. In such an environment, Obstacles are everywhere. Those who live there cannot move and make a good living beyond the confines of the hood. If they try to control too many things and become aggressive, they tend to make their lives harder and shorter. The violence they initiate only comes back at them with equal force. With so many physical limitations, hustlers have learned to develop mental freedom. They cannot let their minds be bothered by all these hindrances. Their thoughts have to keep moving creating new ventures, new hustles, new directions in music and clothes. That is why trends change so quickly in the hood, which often serves as the engine for new styles and the culture at large. With people, hustlers have to adapt to all of their differences, wearing the mask that is appropriate for each situation, deflecting people's suspicion. Hustlers are consummate chameleons, if they can maintain this mental and social fluidity, they can feel a degree of freedom beyond all the physical confinements of the hood. You too face a world full of obstacles and limitations, a new environment where the competition is more global, complicated, and intense than ever before. Like the hustler, you must find your freedom through the fluidity of your thoughts and your constant inventiveness. This means having a greater willingness to experiment 
trying several ventures without fear of failing here or there. It also means constantly looking to develop new styles, new directions you can take, freeing yourself up from any inertia that comes with age. In a world full of people who are too conventional in their thinking, who respect the past far too much, such flow will inevitably translate into power and more room to move. The fearless types in history all reveal a greater capacity to handle chaos and to use it for their purposes. No greater example of this can be found than Mao Zedong. China in the 1920s was a country on the verge of radical change. The old imperial order that had suffocated China for centuries had finally fallen apart. But fearing the disorder that could be unleashed in such a vast country, the two parties vying for control, the nationalists and the communists, opted to try to contain the situation as best they could. The nationalists offered the old-style imperial order with a new face. The communists decided to impose on China the Lenin model, waging a proletariat revolution. Centered in urban areas, controlling key cities in the country, and enforcing strict adherence to party dogma among its followers. This had worked well in the Soviet Union, creating order in a short period of time, but it had no relevance to China. By the end of the decade, this strategy was failing miserably. On the verge of annihilation, the communists turned to Mao, who had a totally different concept of what to do. Mao, had been raised in a small village among the country's vast peasant population. As part of his upbringing, he was immersed in the ancient belief systems of Taoism, which saw change as the essence of nature and conforming to these changes as the source of all power. In the end, according to Taoism, you are stronger by having a softness that allows you to bend and adapt Mao was not afraid of the vast size and population of China. The chaos this could represent would simply become a part of his strategy. His idea was to enlist the help of the peasantry so that communist soldiers could blend into the countryside like fish and water. He would not attack city centers or try to occupy any single position in the country. Instead, he would move the army around like a vaporous force that would attack and then disappear. The enemy never knowing where it was coming from or what it was up to. This guerrilla force would stay in constant motion, allowing the enemy no breathing space and giving them a sense of chaos. The nationalists epitomized the opposite school of fighting, conventional to the core. When Mao finally unleashed on them his new brand of warfare, they could not adapt. They held on to key positions while the communists encircled them in the vast spaces of China. The nationalists control narrowed to the point of a few cities and soon they crumbled completely in one of the most remarkably swift turnarounds in military history. Understand, it is not only what you do that must have flow, but also how you do things. It is your strategies, your methods of attacking problems that must constantly be adapted to circumstances. Strategy is the essence of human action, the bridge between an idea and its realization in the world. Too often these strategies become frozen into conventions as people mindlessly imitate what worked before. By keeping your strategies attuned to the moment, you can be an agent of change, the one who breaks up these dead ways of acting, gaining tremendous power in the process. Most people in life are rigid and predictable. That makes them easy targets. Your fluid, unpredictable strategies will drive them insane. They cannot foresee your next move or figure you out. That is often enough to make them give way or fall apart. Keys to fearlessness. Thus, one's victories in battle cannot be repeated. 
They take their form in response to inexhaustibly changing circumstances. It can be likened to water, as water varies its flow according to the fall of the land. Sun Tzu. All of us have experienced at some point in our lives a feeling of momentum. Perhaps we do something that strikes a chord and we get recognized for it. This positive attention fills us with unusual confidence, which in turn attracts people to us. Now, brimming with self-belief, we are able to pull off another good action. Even if it is not so perfect, people will now tend to overlook the rough patches. We have the aura of success about us. So many times in life, one good thing seems to follow another. This will go on until inevitably we disrupt the flow. Perhaps we overreach with an action that breaks the spell. Or we keep repeating the same things and people grow tired of us and move on to someone else. Just as quickly, the opposite momentum can afflict us. Our own insecurities start to get in the way. The little imperfections that people overlook before now seem glaring. We enter a run of bad fortune and feelings of depression render us more and more immobile. On the other end of the spectrum, we recognize the phenomenon but we treat it as if it were something mystical, beyond conscious control and explanation. But it is not as mysterious as we might think. In the midst of any run of momentum, we generally feel more open. We allow ourselves to be carried along. The confidence we have when things are going well makes people get out of our way or join our side, giving our actions added force. Sometimes a feeling of urgency, we have to get something done, pushes us to act in a particularly energetic manner. And this starts a good run. This is often accompanied with a feeling that we have little to lose by trying something bold. Perhaps feeling somewhat desperate, we loosen up and experiment. What ties this all together is that something inside of us opens up and we allow a greater range of motion. Our style becomes freer and bolder. We move with the current. On the other hand, when a run of momentum ends, it is usually from something we do, a kind of unconscious self-sabotage. We react against this loosening up out of some fear of where it could lead us. We become conservative and the flow of energy stops, slowly reversing itself into stasis and depression. In many ways, we are the ones in control of this phenomenon, but it does not operate on a conscious enough level. Understand, Momentum in life comes from increased fluidity, a willingness to try more, to move in a less constricted fashion. On many levels, it remains something hard to put into words. But by understanding the process, becoming more conscious of the elements involved, you can place your mind in a ready position, better able to exploit any positive moment in your life Call this calculated momentum. For this purpose, you must practice and master the following four types of flow. Mental flow. In the time of Leonardo da Vinci's youth, mid 15th century, knowledge had hardened into rigid compartments. In one slot, there was philosophy and scholasticism. In another, the arts, which were considered more like simple crafts. In yet another, science, which was not yet very empirical. On the margins stood all forms of dark knowledge, the arts of the occult. Da Vinci was the illegitimate son of a notary. And because of this murky social position, he was denied the usual formal education all of which became a great blessing in disguise. His mind was freed from all the prejudices and rigid categories of thinking that prevailed at that time. He went to serve an apprenticeship in the studio of the great artist Vero Shio. And once he began to learn there the craft of drawing and painting, a 
process was set in motion that led to the forming of one of the most original minds in the history of mankind. Knowledge in one field simply opened up in Da Vinci an insatiable hunger to learn something else in a related field. The study of painting led to that of design in general, which led to an interest in architecture. From there, he flowed to studying engineering, making war machines and strategy, observing animals and the mechanics of motion that could be applied to technology, studying birds, aerodynamics, the anatomy of animals and humans, the relationship between emotions and physiology, and on and on. This incredible stream of ideas even overflowed into areas of the occult. His mind would recognize no boundaries. He sought the connections between all natural phenomena. In this sense, he was ahead of his time and the first real Renaissance man. His discoveries in various fields had a momentum, the intensity of one leading to another. Many could not understand him and thought he was eccentric, even erratic. But great patrons such as King Francois I of France and even Caesar Borgier recognized his genius and sought to exploit it. Today, we have regressed to a point that resembles the pre-Renaissance. Knowledge has once again hardened into rigid categories, with intellectuals shut off in various ghettos. Intelligent people are considered serious by virtue of how deeply they immerse themselves in one field of study, their viewpoint becoming more and more myopic. Someone who crosses these rigid demarcations is inevitably considered a dilettante. After college, we are all encouraged to specialize to learn one thing well and stick to it. We end up strangling ourselves in the narrowness of our interests. With all of these restrictions, knowledge has no flow to it. Life does not have these categories. They are mere conventions that we mindlessly abide by. Da Vinci remains the icon and the inspiration for a new form of knowledge. In this form, what matters are the connections between things not what separates them. The mind has a particular momentum itself. When it heats up and discovers something new, it tends to find other items to study and illuminate. All of the greatest innovations in history come from an openness to discovery, one idea leading to another, sometimes coming from unrelated fields. You must develop this spirit and the same insatiable hunger for knowledge. This comes from widening your fields of study and observation, letting yourself be carried along by what you discover. You will find that you will come up with unexpected ideas, the kind that will lead to new practices or novel opportunities. If things run dry in your particular line of work, you have developed your mind along other lines that you can now exploit. Having such mental flow will allow you to constantly think around any obstacle and maintain your career momentum. Emotional flow. By nature, we are emotional creatures. It is how we primarily react to events. Only afterwards are we able to see that such emotional responses can be destructive and need to be reined in. You cannot repress this part of human nature, nor should you ever try. It is like a flood that will overwhelm you all the more for your attempts to dam it up. What you want is for these endless emotions that assail you during the day to wash over you, to never hold on to one single emotion for very long. You are able to let go of any kind of obsessive feeling. If someone says something that bothers you, you find a way to move quickly past the feeling either to excuse what they said, to make it less important, or to forget. Forgetting is a skill that you must develop in order to have emotional flow. If you cannot help but feel anger or disgust in the moment, make it a point to not let it remain the following day. When you hold on to emotions like that, it is as if you put blinders on your eyes. For that amount of time, you see and feel only what this emotion dictates. 
falling behind events. Your mind stops on feelings of failure, disappointment, and mistrust, giving you that awkwardness of someone out of tune with the moment. Without realizing it, all of your strategies become infected by these feelings, pushing you off course. To combat this, you must learn the art of counterbalance. When you are fearful, force yourself to act in a bolder fashion than usual. When you feel inordinate hate, find some object of love or admiration that you can focus on with intensity. One strong emotion tends to cancel out the other and help you move past it. It might seem that intense feelings of love, hate, or anger can be used to impel you forward on some project, but that is an illusion. Such emotions give you a burst of energy that falls quickly and leaves you as low as you were high. Rather, you want a more balanced emotional life with fewer highs and lows. This not only helps you keep moving and overcoming petty obstacles, but it also affects people's perceptions of you. They come to see you as someone who has grace under pressure, a steady hand, and they will turn to you as a leader. Maintaining such steadiness will keep that positive flow in motion. Social flow. Working with people on any level can be a disorderly affair. They bring their differences and own energy to the project, as well as their own agendas. The natural tendency for a leader is to try to tamp down these differences and get everyone on the same page. This seems like the strong thing to do, but in fact it stems from that infantile fear of the unpredictable, and in the end, it becomes counterproductive, as those who work for you bring less and less energy to the task. After an initial burst of enthusiasm in your venture, the discontent of those working for you can quickly stifle any momentum you had developed. Early in his career, the great Swedish director, Ingmar Bergman, used this more tyrannical approach in dealing with his actors. But he began to be dissatisfied with its results and so decided to experiment with something different. He would sketch out the script for a film leaving the dialogue mostly open. He would then invite his actors to bring their own energy and experiences into the mix, shaping the dialogue to fit their emotional responses. This would make the screenplay come alive from within, and sometimes it would require rewriting parts of the plot. In working with the actors on this level, Bergman would enter their spirit, mirroring their energy as a way to get them to relax and open up. He allowed for this more and more as his career evolved, and the results were astonishing. The actors came to love this, feeling more involved and engaged. They wanted to work with him, and their enthusiasm carried over into their performances, each one better than the last. His films had the feel of something much more lifelike and engaging than those structured around some rigid script. His work became increasingly popular as he went further with this collaborative process. This should be your model in any venture that involves groups of people. You provide the framework based on your knowledge and expertise, but you allow room for this project to be shaped by those involved in it. They are motivated and creative, helping to give the project more flow and force. You are not going too far in this process, you set the overall direction and tone. You are simply letting go of that fearful need to make people do exactly as you desire. In the long run, you will find that your ability to gently divert people's energy in your direction gives you a wider range of control over the shape and result of the project. Cultural Flow In the 1940s, the great saxophone player Charlie Parker single-handedly revolutionized the world of jazz with his invention of the style known as bebop. But he watched it soon become the convention in jazz. And within a few years, he was no longer the revolutionary figure worshiped by hipsters. 
Younger artists emerged who took his adventures to another level. This was immensely disturbing to him and he spiraled downward, dying at an early age. The trumpeter, Miles Davis, had been a part of Parker's ensemble and he personally witnessed this decline. Davis understood the situation at its core. Jazz was an incredibly fluid form of music that underwent tremendous changes in style in short periods of time. Because America did not honor or take care of its black musicians, the ones who found themselves surpassed by a new trend had to suffer a terrible fate like Parker. Davis vowed to overcome this dynamic. His solution was to never settle on one style. Every four years or so, he would radically reinvent his sound. His audiences would have to catch up with the changes, and most often, they did. It soon became a self-fulfilling prophecy, as he was seen as someone who had his finger on the latest trend, and his new sound would be studied and emulated. As part of this strategy, he would always hire the youngest generation of performers to work with him, harnessing the creativity that comes with youth. In this way, he developed a kind of steady momentum that carried him past the usual decline in a jazz musician's career. He kept this inventiveness up for over 30 years, something unheard of in the genre. Understand, you exist in a particular cultural moment with its own flow and style. When you are young, you are more sensitive to these fluctuations in taste, and so you generally keep up with the present. But as you get older, the tendency is for you to become locked in a style that is dead, one that you associate with your youth and its excitement. If enough time passes, your style lock can become quite ludicrous. You look like a museum piece. Your momentum will grind to a halt as people come to categorize you in a narrow period of time. Instead, you must find a way to periodically reinvent yourself. You are not trying to mimic the latest trend. That will make you look equally ludicrous. You are simply rediscovering that youthful attentiveness to what is happening around you and incorporating what you like into a newer spirit. You are taking pleasure in shaping your personality, wearing a new mask. The only thing you really have to fear is becoming a social and cultural relic. Reversal of Perspective in Western culture, we tend to associate strength of character with consistency. People who shift around too much with their ideas and image can be judged as untrustworthy and even demonic. We honor those who are true to the past and certain timeless values. On the other hand, people who challenge and change the prevailing conventions are often viewed as destructive figures, at least while they are alive. The great Florentine writer Nicola Machiavelli saw these values of consistency and orders as products of a fearful culture and something that should be reversed. In his view, it is precisely our fixed nature, our tendency to hold to one line of action or thought, that is the source of human misery and incompetence. A leader can come to power through acts of boldness. But when the times shift and require something more cautious, he generally will continue with his bold approach. He is not strong enough to adapt. He is a prisoner of his fixed nature. What raised him above others then becomes the source of his downfall. True figures of power, as Machiavelli saw it, would be people who could shape their own character call up the qualities that were necessary for the moment and know how to bend to circumstance. Those who remain true to some idea or value without self-examination often prove to be the worst tyrants in life. They make others conform to dead concepts 
They are negative forces holding back the change that is necessary for any culture to evolve and prosper. This is how you must operate. You actively work to overcome this fixed nature, deliberately trying a different approach and style than your usual one to get a sense of a different possibility. You come to view periods of stability and order with mistrust. Something isn't moving in your life and in your mind. On the other hand, moments of change and apparent chaos are what you thrive on. They make your mind and spirit jump to life. If you reach such a point, you have tremendous power. You have nothing to fear from moments of transition. You welcome, even create them. Whenever you feel rooted and established in place, that is when you should be truly afraid. People wish to be settled. Only as far as they are unsettled is there any hope for them. Ralph Waldo Emerson.